after a 2011 paper showed that Americans largely prefer a fairly equal wealth distribution, many media outlets share results of the study, including this beautifully made video that has been watched over 25 million times. In our last video, we explained the main problems with such an equal distribution. It means that one, young households somehow already have hundreds of thousands of dollars in wealth to invest, which can then, two, leads to tens of millions of dollars by retirement, all while the oldest households in the distribution have, at most, a couple million dollars for retirement. So if this supposed ideal distribution is not fair, what does a fair distribution look like, and why don't they seem to exist in the real world? For this video, we will need to make some pretty strong assumptions to work out an ideal distribution. We'll keep some of the ones we used from the last video and add some more. For example, in an ideal world, households that are older have more wealth than younger households since the younger ones will have more time to grow their wealth. We will also assume that there is $161 trillion of household wealth in the U.S. and 132 million households. We also won't distinguish between different households at first, but later, that'll be an important thing to consider. We will also assume that households get an average return on their wealth of 7%, which is slightly lower than the inflation-adjusted return of the S&P 500. One way to define a fair wealth distribution is that each household has enough wealth that it would grow to the same amount by the time the head of house reaches 65. And every household older than that maintains their wealth as they live off the interest. So a very young household might not have much now since they have a long time for it to grow. We will also start with the assumption that each household doesn't save any more towards retirement. Those are enough assumptions for us to get started. To find the values for a fair wealth distribution we defined earlier, then we need to find out how much wealth households need at different stages of life so they grow exponentially to the same amount at 65 and the total wealth remains 161 trillion. Before we can divide up the wealth, we need some data. I found some census data that has the number of households in several age brackets. Let's pick a middle age value for each of these brackets to represent a typical person in the age bracket to make calculations easier. Next, we need to create a multiplier to know how much of a nest egg will grow at any age if we assume continuously compounding growth, then we can use the exponential growth formula here. So each dollar invested by a 23-year-old would grow to about $18 by the time they're 65. So if the household needed $2 million in retirement, then they only need about 1 18th of that now, so a little more than 100 grand. And by the time they retire, they would have $2 million. Now we can do the same calculations for the other ages to find their investment multiplier. Now if we know the value of retirement, we can calculate the amount of wealth at the other ages pretty easily. We just divide by this multiplier. But how are we going to find the amount that the retirees have? We can set up an equation. Let's call the amount retirees have X. I will give X amount to all retirees. 28% of households are in this 65 plus group according to our data, so I can multiply that amount by the number of households to get the total amount of wealth the 65 plus age group has. How about the next group? I'm not going to give the 60-year-olds as much because they still have some time to grow their money. So I take the retiree amount, divide by the 60-year-old growth multiplier found earlier, and give that amount to all households in this group, about 17.8% of the households. I do that same reasoning for all of the age groups. If I add up all these amounts, it should equal $161 trillion, and now I can solve for x. Luckily, we can factor out an x from each of these terms and divide by this amount we find that X equals about $2.4 million. You may be surprised how little that amount is, or you may be surprised how much that is. 2.4 million in wealth is a nice amount. Assuming that about half a million of that is a paid off house and another 100,000 is in non-investable assets, then that gives the retirees about 1.8 million to invest. And with the 4% rule, that gives retirees less than 72,000 to live off of. Not bad, just under the median household income of the US, but maybe not the dream retirement many envision, but it could still be a nice retirement. Okay, now that we have a value for the retirees, we can fill in everyone else. The youngest households get about $126,000. That's a lot of money for a young household. You can see that the money grows across the age groups to eventually reach 2.4 million values for the retirees. This distribution is one that could be considered fair. Notice that at the low end, it's far from the ideal that was so widely touted with only about 10% of wealth going to the bottom two quintiles, or the bottom 40% of the households. We need more at the top and a lot less at the bottom than the ideal suggests. It is much more equal than the actual distribution, 
and falls in between the distribution that people estimated the wealth distribution to be in the study and the proposed ideal distribution. But this still might not be fair because households could actually save more money and invest that money as well. What if a household earns a median income and invests 10%? Maybe they work for an organization that has a 401k match. The employee puts in 5%, the organization matches it with another 5%. How much money would the household have if they did this from age 23 to 65? I did some calculations in a spreadsheet and I got a value of about 1.6 million. Adding that to the 2.4 million, that household would have wealth in the $4 million range, a substantial amount more than other retirees. So if we expect households to save towards their retirement, in our fair distribution we could distribute less wealth to the younger families. This means we can reallocate the wealth so retirees have more money. I calculated the amount of 401k wealth for each group, subtracted that from the total, and redistributed the rest in the same way we did earlier. It didn't really change things that much. The retirees get about $100,000 more, but overall, not a lot of change. About 100 trillion of the 161 trillion is in 401ks, so we don't have nearly as much left to distribute. Well, if saving 10% gets about two-thirds of the total wealth in the U.S., what percentage would people need to save for the full retirement? Well, the answer is 15%. If someone averaged the median income in their life and saved 15%, hopefully some of that's with a match from an employer, then they will end up with $2.4 million adjusted for inflation, right around the amount they would get in a fair distribution. If they buy a house, then some of that 15% could be part of their mortgage because their house could count towards their net worth. So in the case assuming the median home value of a half a million, only 12% needs to be saved. So some might say that this level of wealth creation is within reach of almost all US households. Someone else might counter though, there's no way to save 12% and buy a house on a median income in many cities. Well, you all can battle that out in the comments. I'm not gonna say more here. So why don't we have such a fair wealth distribution? Well, one reason is that people make different choices with their life and money. Many of you can think of other ideas as well, but some reasonable variations about what people do with their money is all that is needed to get our current wealth inequality. And I'll show you how. Here's a simple simulation. Let's take a group of 54 23 year olds. One third makes the median income, one third makes half of that, and one third makes twice that. They assumed a 2% raise in real terms each year, but within each of these groups, one third invests 5%, one third 10%, and another third 20% of their income. Now within each of these, one group is conservative with their investments or have a few bad years and end up averaging 4% return, another third, the typical 7%, and another 11%, which is what some business owners make, or smart investors, or lucky investors that timed Bitcoin correctly. Let's throw in one more person that doesn't save anything. That gives us a total of 55 people. Let's assume that half of all those work until they're 75, or are able to let their wealth grow until they're 75, while the other half retire at 65 and start living off the interest. If we order all of their wealth from lowest to greatest and group them in quintiles, then the pie chart looks like this. It's not very equal, and these are people that are all the same age. This doesn't include the many cohorts that are younger and have so much less. If you include those, then the pie chart looks something like this, which is remarkably similar to the current U.S. distribution. So one thing to make of this is that the current U.S. distribution is about what we would expect to see since people earn different amounts of money, save different amounts, invest it differently, and for different time frames. Whatever your view of the insanely rich, it's important to note that it's not the insanely rich that are the driver of wealth inequality. If you drop all billionaires from the US, the wealth distribution is still basically the same. Even taking out all households in the top 1%, it still looks the same. The wealth distribution of the bottom 90% of the US which is every household with less than about $1.6 million, is barely more equitable than the entire country. It seems the driver of wealth inequality is more about typical Americans that are saving and investing over a long time versus households with very little. The young households are those that aren't saving and investing, are those that can't. If you're uncomfortable changing the tax structure to give 19 to 25 year olds tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, well, here's another option. The earlier we give someone money, the less we need to give them, since it has longer to grow. So why not, at birth, give them a trust? 
In the second model, where we expect households to contribute to their retirement, then we would only have to give $9,300. Even if Uncle Sam doesn't go for it, it's a great thought for parents or grandparents if they have the funds to invest a few thousand dollars for their kid at birth. So we have a couple fair wealth distributions we can now shoot for. How to get there? Well, the only idea I tossed out was funding a trust for each person at birth to grow over time. If you have ideas, put them in the comments. One important thing we've learned is that even fair distributions are quite skewed. And since households have the freedom to use their money as they want and face different circumstances, even if we start with a fair distribution, it will soon become more skewed that will drive variation in wealth, which leads to an overall distribution that looks like what the US has or something like what the majority of countries are facing. And that story is the same, even excluding the insanely rich. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Be sure to follow Math the World on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for your support.